everybody. Good afternoon, if everybody could please take a seat. Good afternoon and welcome to the Transportation Committee meeting of May 11, 2016. I'm Councilman Mike Barnum, the Chair of the Committee. Uh, I am uh, honored to be joined today by my colleagues, Mr. David Rue of the 4th District, Mr. Jose Wiesar of the 14th District, Mr. Paul Caretz of the 5th District, and uh, Ms. Martinez of the 6th District uh, will be joining us uh, a bit later uh, in the afternoon. Uh, but she will be here before we are done. Uh, so let me begin, as is our practice in this committee, with uh, the multimodal roll call. Uh, since the uh, last month or so since this committee has met, uh, who has commuted by train? You were on oh, the expo ride. You're right. <laughs> I saw you on the train. Um, expo line opening May 20th, and Mr. Koretz and I took a test ride the other day. Uh, who has commuted by bus? Excellent. Uh, pedestrian. Everybody's a pedestrian. Every hand should go up on that one. Um, Uber, Lyft, taxi. Rideshare. Carpool. Awesome. Okay. Carpool. Excellent. So uh, let us begin. Uh, there are, uh, let, me, let me start with uh, general public comment. Uh, we have three general public comment cards. Wayne, Ms. Ramirez, and Dr. Tom Williams. Adam. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Sweet. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, um, ladies and gentlemen. The transportation. There have been improvements. The signs are now better posted. The wetbacks and the gangbangers are not removing them, so I'm grateful. However, when we have the events, we're still on weekends. We have a problem getting in or out. There's chaos with the buses, like, for example, 733 on Spring Street heading towards Venice or Santa Monica. Impossible. Even the bus drivers didn't know what time their detours began and what time it ended. It was two-hour wait. Um, the other one is the LA dot from the dash Monday through Friday is wonderful because you, you can go from Little Tokyo all the way to Grand on First Street um, and or further and get off. But on weekends or after hours, 6.30, you cannot catch a bus, a metro, that takes you from uh, First Street, uh, San Pedro, all the way up to Grand. Um, it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. And uh, Or even on Temple. You have to kind of go around, catch the A bus, and then take the B bus to get to the Kenneth Hahn building. Help us here, please. Thank you. Williams. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tom Williams, Sierra Club, also LA 32 Neighborhood Council, speaking regarding the SR 710. It's part of the Measure R2 requirements for the coming ballot measure. One of the issues here is that in 2012, the City of Los Angeles said that no surface construction would be within the city of Los Angeles. However, as proposed in the environmental impact report, eh, it's only a thousand feet of the most destructive part of the entire tunnel excavations will be north of Valley Boulevard. That is within the city of Los Angeles and not within the city of El Hamro, where the rest of it is. But the most destructive is still located within the city of Los Angeles and should be removed from the MTA's proposed ballot. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Spindler. Yes, we had a Wilshire corridor plan. Looks like we got $7.2 million of money to improve Wilshire Boulevard. Why is Woodland Hills only getting 11,200 of the money? Why is Encino only getting 50,000 of the money? And the other $6.1 million is going over on the Coenga side. I, I couldn't get an answer from these people. Now also, on your new measure extension, all of the valley improvements aren't gonna take effect till 2030 at the earliest. And we're not going to get light rail on the orange line on the plan till approximately 2050. So again, all of the neighborhood councils in the valley are, are asking a no vote on all of the sales tax initiatives regarding transportation measures. I support a big no. And finally, for the first time in three years, Jose Weezer showed up to this committee. Welcome. 
All right, so that You're at the last meeting, right? apparently not, <laughs> uh, or, or, or many others. Uh, so that uh, closes general public comment for this meeting. Uh, colleagues, I'm going to recommend, uh, well, for item number one, uh, the general manager couldn't be here today due to a, a meeting with the mayor. Uh, so we're going to dispense with item number one, which is the general manager's report. And then I'm going to recommend for consent items two through seven and 14. Uh, Mr. Chair, for item number three, we should receive and file that in as much as that street isn't in, under our jurisdiction. Okay. All right. Can you say one, two, one? Yeah, I did. 14 is a piece of the canyon pardon. Oh, yeah, I get yeah. that. Okay. So without objection, uh, we will uh, approve items two, four, five, six, seven, and 14 and receive and file items three. Okay, that brings us to uh, item number um, eight. Uh, Mr. Williams is uh, one card on that one. Um, item number eight is the city attorney report and ordinance relative Williams. to amending the municipal code to provide for exception that authorizes parking on bridges. Uh, good afternoon. Dr. Tom Williams, uh, Citizens Coalition for Safe Community and Sierra Club. Uh, basic issue, bridges. How do you define a bridge? Does that include all overpasses of all freeways? There's an issue. Maybe it should, maybe it shouldn't. I believe no. No on any parking on any bridge, overpass, or elevated crossing of anything. Basically for the safety issues, but for the Los Angeles River, this is a historic land. Most of the bridges, except for now, avenues are 6th Street, are historic monuments. We're trying to improve the appearance of the LA River, not use it as a parking lot. And by the way, if you're going to have parking on it, are you going to have parking meters? And how much will it cost? And who's going to enforce it? No parking on bridges or overpasses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, do we have uh, a motion to approve item number eight? So, uh, can I have a question on this, please? Sure. Absolutely. Staff here on this, or? Staff here on item number eight? Just, just briefly, uh, on this item, if we move towards parking on bridges and we're lo looking to create uh, and establish our or implement our bicycle master plan, how would that coincide with that? Do we, are we taking that into account, um, some of our bicycle uh, um, lanes that we're thinking of implementing and now, is this going to negative impact our, our bicycle network at all? Have we looked at that? This is Dan Mitchell, Assistant General Manager with LADOT. Uh, the item before you is just to provide the opportunity to uh, permit parking on bridges. Uh, it wouldn't require that we allow parking on bridges and so the coordination with any uh, bicycle facilities would be the same as on any other street. But right now, um, Mr. Nagel, maybe correct me, right now we're not even permitted to allow parking on, on any bridge if a street happens to have a section that has a bridge on it. Right, that's correct. And in terms of uh, one of the questions that was asked about historic bridges, obviously we'd also have to take into consideration any environmental and other historical okay. factors or any restrictions that we would have because of that. As Dan said, this only goes, gives the department the discretion where it is feasible to do it. Good. So this permits it and then any other type of analysis will go with it as we do with any other thing, obstruction of traffic or if bike lanes are proposed, it'll go through that process. When, That's right. When it's consistent allowed. with okay, how we evaluate great. parking on any other any section other. of street. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, the item has been moved and seconded, so without objection, item number eight uh, is approved. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead to uh, item 13 and come back to uh, uh, 10, 11, and 9. Item number 13 is a Bond and Harris Dawson motion relative relative to a request for proposals to provide an affordable housing project to serve homeless persons at the city-owned parking lot 731 in on North Venice Boulevard. Thank you, colleagues. By way of introduction, uh, this is a motion that uh, I submitted uh, a couple weeks ago. 
uh, pursuant to the comprehensive homelessness strategy that the uh, city endorsed back in February, uh, which complements the county homelessness strategy approved on the same day in February. Uh, one of the, the major items in that report was to uh, start using city-owned property uh, throughout the city of Los Angeles uh, to uh, build affordable or homeless housing. And uh, the CAO is working on a report that will be detailing the availability of a number of properties throughout the city that will either be sold for affordable housing purposes or used to develop affordable or homeless housing. Um, I didn't want to wait for that. I wanted to get started. Uh, in Venice, which I represent, we have one of the largest homeless populations uh, in the city. And uh, I'd rather have people sleeping in units with beds and a roof than having them sleeping in encampments on the sidewalks in front of people's homes. So I moved forward on this and um, because it is a DOT owned parking lot, it's why it's here. The motion asks that DOT begin an RFP process uh, to engage the community and find out what interest there is from developers. I just want to amend that slightly to have DOT working in consultation with CAO, which will be the, the lead on the process. Uh, we have one, two, three, four or five speaker cards. Mark Ryavec, uh, Becky Dennison, and Malcolm Harris, come on up to the table. Okay. I'm going to start. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Councilman. Um, my name is Mark Ryavec. I'm president of the Venice Stakeholders Association. We're a nonprofit uh, organization dedicated to uh, civic improvement. I've appeared before this committee before um, when uh, Mr. Rosendahl was chairing it on other uh, issues of homelessness, particularly RVs and campers in our, in our city. Um, we have a letter is been, being uh, distributed to you from our organization. We have um, five reasons we are opposing this RFP because we believe to start with that it has not been properly vetted in the community. It has not been before the Venice Neighborhood Council. It has not been before the Venice Canals Association, which is literally uh, one of the canals starts on this site um, so that we believe that and we would ask the councilman if he would pull this back and actually take a concept to the community we also believe there are other reasons not to put this project on this site one is that we believe the project desperately is needed for additional beach parking and resident parking um, is that the limit of my time councilman yeah, it does all yeah. right the rest is in my my letter to your committee thank, thank you, you. Uh, Becky Hello, my name is Becky Dennison and I work with Venice Community Housing and I want to speak in strong support of this motion and the need for affordable housing and permanent supportive housing in every neighborhood in Los Angeles and particularly in Venice which is hard hit by homelessness and has hundreds if not thousands of people living on our streets and sidewalks. Um, the need is urgent. You all have expressed that in your homeless plan and in many of your public statements and this is one way for us to move forward. Um, and have a concrete option for producing housing in Venice. Um, I do want to say in, in um, uh, answer to the previous speaker, I do believe the motion calls for public participation process and whoever were to get the RFP would go through that process with the community and meet the needs of the community. Um, as well, the Venice Neighborhood Council, our board of directors, our tenants, hundreds if not thousands of folks have weighed in in support of affordable housing and Mr. Bonin held a community meeting specifically addressing this parking lot. So the community has weighed in on this and they've weighed in in support and will continue to do so. So I hope you move the fo motion forward quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harris. And then uh, while he's speaking, uh, Ms. Ramirez and, and Wayne from Encino can come on up because they're the next comment. Malcolm Harris, Organizing Director for, with Trust South Los Angeles. We strongly support the motion to create an RFP to produce affordable housing um, in the city-owned lot, uh, parking lot in Venice. The homeless crisis in L.A. is unacceptable and impacts all of our neighborhoods. On a personal level, as someone who went to high school in the Venice area and grew up in the Venice community, I am very aware of the deep need for housing and affordable and permanently supportive housing in um, the Venice community and area. But on an organizational level, Trust South L.A. knows and believes that all options for increasing affordable housing development are needed, and the use of city-owned lots helps us do this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Ramirez. Thank you very much. Um, as you can see, I too am homeless, but I'm homeless uh, by design. I'm a victim of gang stalking. So I am, I am here. Um, and I carry my shopping cart and everything with me. Um, I think it's a wonderful idea if we can find vacant lots and build affording, affordable housing. But that's not just the problem. 
The reason I'm on the street is because no matter where I go to, whether it's hotel, motels, or rent a room, they get into my room. They get into my home. How? They always do. These gangbangers, wetbacks, and all these gang stalkers. So rather than living or staying in a hotel paying $700 a week, I end up on the street. What's the point? I want something with safety and security. Either touch the lock with your finger that only you can open it because they are able to penetrate everything inside your uh, lock and door and get in and damage and destroy your property. And now what's the point? I might as well live on the street, which I do. Um, it's a mother. Please look up retired ex-FBI agent Ted Gunderson on YouTube for gang stalking. Thank you, sir, very much. The parking lots are for beach access. They're not to give away to your developer friends to go get pork barrel projects. We need beach access parking. That's what the parking lots are for. And all of your wealthy, white-skinned friends living over there by the beach with their multi-million dollar homes are not going to want a homeless shelter built next to their multi-million dollar cubicle homes overlooking the beach view, do they? No. And that's why they haven't done any outreach. Now, as I read, you're going to give away a cherished parking lot where we already don't have enough parking in Venice free so some developer scumbag can pay off with campaign donations a promise to build quote unquote affordable housing affordable housing in venice could be somebody making a hundred thousand dollars a year that's a low income in that area so it's all nebulous no on this project until there's extensive outreach uh, thank you to those who gave testimony. Uh, for the record, I just want to add a few uh, notes into the record on this project. Uh, this project is one where we're talking uh, specifically about uh, homeless housing, not affordable housing in general. There are other affordable housing projects uh, proposed and in the works in my district. Um, I did want, for the record, to note a few things. Uh, there has been uh, a contention that there has been no community outreach on this concept. Uh, as uh, was noted by one of the speakers, there actually was a meeting attended by several hundred people where the project was introduced to the community at the end of March. Uh, there was an extensive community survey done in advance about the use of uh, parking lots in Venice for development of affordable and homeless housing. And as this process goes forward, there will be a considerable number of public hearings, including with the Neighborhood Council and, and others. Uh, there... Um, uh, also has been a contention that facilities serving the homeless people have been a burden to nearby residents and uh, some anecdotal uh, evidence presented for that. Um, I would instead counter that there is an incredibly rich history throughout the city of Los Angeles uh, and in the west side in my district in particular where there are homeless housing facilities and permanent supportive housing facilities that do such a phenomenal job integrating with the community that a lot of people don't know they're there. Uh, there is a facility uh, of a couple dozen units in Del Rey that the Del Rey Neighborhood Council approved enthusiastically, operated by Path Ventures, which has had no complaints since it, ha since it has opened. Uh, there is a beautiful facility that Hollywood Community Housing and Venice Community Housing uh, just opened again in Del Rey with the full backing and enthusiasm of the Del Rey Neighborhood Council that uh, blends in so well to the community that when I asked folks in the neighborhood if they could pick out which were the uh, artist lofts and which were uh, the, the building that was for permanent supportive housing, they couldn't tell. Uh, there was a home, again, in Del Rey, nearby Venice, where veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan uh, who had been homeless and facing trouble uh, in the wake of uh, their return from service uh, uh, opened up a home and uh, there was some initial reaction that was negative until it was opened, and then neighbors came to embrace it uh, and had it integrated fully into the community. Uh, there's a number of other projects I could go on and on uh, throughout my district, throughout the city, and I think it's important to note and stop trying to, to scapegoat uh, and make uh, boogeymen out of people when it is our obligation to uh, provide housing throughout the city. 
It's also been noted that um, there are less utilized and more isolated city parking lots in other parts of Council District 11 and indeed elsewhere in the city. And that is absolutely true. And uh, I'm looking forward to the CAO's report, which will identify a number of those uh, for uh, similar use. Uh, so colleagues, uh, with that, uh, yes, please. Uh, just for the record, can I just um, commend you on your leadership and, your, and being such a champion on this issue? Um, you know, um, tr tackling the homeless issue, as we all know, is a difficult one. And we have to understand, um, many in the community usually are afraid that building a facility like this, especially for the chronic homeless, people are afraid that we're going to ship people in from another neighborhood, from another community, uh, which is not the case. Because the homeless community are our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, fathers, and our children. And, um, and in many cases, they're, they usually stay in the area they're, they're most um, uh, familiar with. So I really commend you on your leadership and, your, and, your, and you being such a champion on homeless issues, along with Councilmember Council Huizar and the rest of the city council, and I'm, I'm proud to be your colleague. Thank you, Mr. with you on this. I appreciate that. Uh, the approach I've taken on this is that the number one complaint I get in Venice is about people living on the streets in encampments, and um, the alternative to having them sleep on the sidewalks isn't to pretend that we can blink and make them disappear. It's to provide We're housing. In jail. It, right. Which... It just goes back and forth. Revolving. Exactly. So we need to provide the housing. Uh, so with that amendment that the CAO work with DOT and be the lead on this, um, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. moved and seconded uh, without objection. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, that brings us to item number nine. Item number nine is the Buscaino bond in motion relative to requesting the city attorney to prepare an ordinance amending the municipal code to prohibit parking of vehicles with a for sale sign on west the both side or the south side of West Redondo Beach Boulevard. And we have uh, three public comment cards on this one: Officer Carmen Gutierrez, uh, Lupe Garcia, and Rosalie Preston. Good afternoon. Officer, why don't you begin? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Carmen Gutierrez, and uh, I'm assigned to Southeast Division as a senior lead officer. As a senior lead officer, I have a, right now assigned to Harbor Gateway North area. And uh, one of my duties is to uh, work with the community with quality of life issues. It was brought to my attention about cars that are parked off of Redondo Beach Boulevard between... Uh, the 110 freeway in Vermont on the city side, on the south side, with for sale signs. I have been monitoring the location for a lot of months, almost a year, and uh, at one time I could see up to over 10 cars parked with no for sale signs. Uh, definitely this is a quality of life issue in, in my area, and also besides that there's a lot of loitering in the area because uh, uh, people are trying to buy these cars and so that brings more people to the street which makes it dangerous for uh, traffic accidents. Also the other issue there would be um, no parking for the residents on the south side right there off of... Can I continue? Thank you. <laughs> Ma'am? Yeah. Uh, I'm Lupe Garcia. I live uh, south of uh, uh, Redondo Beach Boulevard and I'm the one that sees the transactions going on because he comes to do the transactions in front of my house. So that, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rosalie Preston, I'm the uh, president of the Redondo Alondra Neighborhood Watch, and we've received many complaints from those living along Redondo Beach Boulevard, which is uh, almost totally apartments, that the vehicles which are for sale illegally are taking up the parking spaces of the people living in those apartments and making it very difficult for them. And the parking then of the apartment residents extends into the south, into the neighborhood where other people live. So it's a major problem. And as the officer said, I mean, personally, in the last six months, many times I've seen six to seven vehicles for sale along that street. Thank you. Did you have photographs that you wanted to introduce? I did. I had three photos, and it's actually those three photos are different photos, and they were taken the same time. We have this one. 
There should be two more, sir. Taking on yes, the same day. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. It's your testimony okay. that people that are loitering around the cars, the people that are selling them, are creating a traffic hazard? Yes, sir. And yes. You've actually observed that? I have, yes. Okay, because okay. they're walking around the car looking for, I mean, they're checking out the car, make sure that's the car they want to buy. They're trying to get the phone number. Have there been any, any altercations with residents? Have, have there been any, have, have they been peaceful or have they not been peaceful when they're selling the cars? I imagine residents get upset that they have nowhere to park and maybe get in confrontations. Yes, uh, it has brought to my attention when I go to community meetings that, uh, you know, of course the residents have nowhere to park because they're taking the parking stalls from the residents that live on the apartments. Okay. For the, for the record, the uh, and the audio tape that was Mr. Nagel from the city attorney's office uh, who's asking questions, um, who will in the future ask the chair to acknowledge him oh, before he starts. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. Okay. Uh, without objection, that item's approved. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That brings us to uh, item number 10. Item number 10 is a city attorney report and ordinance relative to amending the expiration date for the Southern California gas franchise. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Council members, uh, Jay Kim, Assistant General Manager, DOT. Uh, we do need to extend the current uh, pipeline franchise agreement for SoCal Gas for another year. Uh, the courts are currently considering uh, whether or not local jurisdictions can uh, charge an additional surcharge uh, uh, beyond what's typically collected from the utility companies and uh, the issue is being uh, litigated right now and the courts considering that issue so until that issue is actually resolved at the courts uh, we do need to extend the current uh, uh, um, the terms terms of the agreement to make sure that we're covered for another year until uh, that issue gets resolved in the courts and, and do we or do we not have the authority to make changes or are we only allowed to simply extend the existing terms as they are? We, I believe uh, city attorney could uh, concur on this, but uh, right now, because uh, we're just trying to extend it and we're not refranchising, uh, we really can't change the other terms. Uh, if you have concerns about other issues, this is not the time for us to be able to kind of insert that in. Uh, when we go to complete refranchise, that's really the time that we can actually uh, insert a lot of the new terms that we're looking for. City attorney concur? Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, we have one, two, three public comment cards on this item. Uh, Ms. Ramirez, uh, Wayne from Encino, and Dr. Tom Williams. Thank you again. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't live in this area. Oh, naturally, I'm homeless. Um, and so... What my question is, is, is it really safe? Are you gentlemen really watching for the safety, public safety of all these residents? Are you, you are really the checks and balances. Are you there monitoring the events and the catastrophes and the after effects of this, this brouhaha that came about? Well, I hope that you will be forthright. If not the gas company, it will be you who will be forthright with these residents because that will be your legacy. This was something quite almost like Chernobyl, if maybe close to it. But you want to be forthright with these residents. You want to make sure that you cure this problem and cure it to the best of the best that our technology can help. So all I ask is please, I hope to God that you are going to be forthright with these people and it's going to be safe. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. Thank you. What happened to all our tough talk? I thought we were going to take the gas company and demand new concessions, that we had the upper hand. Especially since, what did they do? Gas us like the fucking Nazis up there in the Liso Canyon? And what are you doing now? Like a bunch of little puppy dogs when they bring their lawyers. We can only extend the contract. We can only extend it. That's all we want to do. I thought we were going to get these new concessions. They're throwing people out of their homes. It took a judge to put them back in their hotel rooms so they don't have to go back and be gassed by fucking benzene. 
These houses have benzene. Benzene is not a good thing to put in the walls in the, in your, of your house. Raise your hands if you want to live in a house filled with benzene. No. Fuck the gas company. Get rid of their lease. Tell them to leave the city of Los Angeles and sue the shit out of them for punitive damages. Dr. Tom Williams, uh, LA 32 Neighborhood Council, Citizens Coalition for a Safe Community, and Save Porter Ranch. I've been working with them for over four, six months now, sorry. Uh, why? Because of erroneous submissions of documents from Southern California Gas Company to Dogger and to the state of California. What will they do with pipelines? A pipeline franchise needs to have a thorough inventory of all of the equipment in place. It also needs to have, oh, an emergency response plan. They were supposed to have one for Elysio Canyon, but nobody ever enforced it. So we need an inventory of what we are threatened by and what the risks are. And we need an emergency response plan, most likely through the Los Angeles Fire Department, because it's a homeland security issue. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, uh, would you like me to bring staff back up? Is there any questions? Or do we have a motion? I do have a question. Okay. Would you like me to bring staff up? Um, okay. Well, is it, item 11 is also a gas franchise issue. Yes, it is. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to clarify that we're not extending any of these contracts uh, by 20 years or so as we originally looked at. This is just a more more temporary yes, measure. Yes, it's just a temporary uh, gap measure, just extended for another year to kind of wade through the court case issues. Uh, there is a larger effort underway uh, to kind of reconsider all the franchise agreements as part of the, uh, the CAO combined CLA report that's re-looking at our uh, regulatory sort of response to the entire franchise, um, you know, agreement sort of setup that we have right now. Very good. So, w the concerns that any of us have w will have a, will be addressed. A year or so yes. to, there will be another opportunity to, to actually those. address all those issues. Okay. Any other questions? Is there a motion to approve? Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second. Uh, okay. Uh, seeing no objection, that item is approved. Thank you, staff. Uh, that brings us to item number 11. Item number 11 is an Englander bond in motion relative to future franchise agreement with the Southern California Gas Company and related matters. Okay, is uh, staff here to report on this? And if uh, a representative uh, from CD12 can come up to frame the motion for us. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Council Member Semi Park from Councilman Englander's office. Um, we respectfully uh, ask for your support for this motion. Um, essentially, as we uh, negotiate a new franchise, um, what we want to do is make sure that there are legal protections in place for the residents of Los Angeles. Um, so what we are asking for is, although this has nothing to do with the operations of the Liso Canyon gas facility, um, I think a lesson learned is communication and notification is key. Um, so what we are asking for in the new franchise is, should there be um, any incidents that the city be uh, notified immediately by the gas company? Also, in order to ensure compliance, the 20-year um, term will be broken down into five-year terms. Um, so that is what we are asking for, um, and we ask for your support. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything staff wants to add at the moment? Okay. Um, so, colleagues, to differentiate for those in the audience uh, from the previous gas company item, as uh, staff indicated, uh, we were ready to start working on a new franchise agreement the framework for it is in doubt because of a court decision. Uh, so in order to let that settle out, we're extending the existing franchises by a year. Uh, in order to frame the renegotiations for any uh, extended contracts beyond that one year, Mr. Englander uh, put in a pretty comprehensive motion, uh, underscoring his uh, pretty strong leadership 
consistently on this issue uh, to make sure that the city proceeds in a more thoughtful, comprehensive, uh, safety-focused way going forward. And this is the beginning of that process. So um, anybody have any questions for uh, DOT staff, for Mr. Hirano, or for CD12 staff? No? Okay. All right. No questions. So you guys can go sit and there's a few public comment cards. Uh, so, uh, Christina Zitkovich, did I get that pronunciation, pronunciation right? Yes. Okay. And um, uh, Mr. Spindler. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to say that this leak didn't happen on October 23rd. This facility has been leaking, spewing, and gassing our entire community for over a decade. And because SoCal Gas has been policing its own facility, nothing has ever been done. This was a blowout. When I was growing up, my dad would say, you use it, you abuse it, and you lose it. If I ran this company, I would probably be behind bars right now, and the company would be shut down. So while this negligent company is giving CEOs a bonus during the largest methane blowout in U.S. history, and they've been busy fear-mongering the entire state with these brownouts, why would we even consider a five-year, 10-year, or 20-year lease for this property? In the last seven months have been pure hell for residents, not only during the blowout, but having to deal with SoCal gas. Please, when you do make the deal with this devil, only do it for one year at a time. We'd like to shut it down. Well, well said. I can remember before the Southern Gas Company, I think this guy here, I think he gassed a few people too. The Hitler Company, yes. SoCal gas. We gas you for free. Benzene all over the place. People in rental housing being th threatened with eviction. And you want to do business with these cocksuckers? This is a contract. This is not the goddamn Cosa Nostra. What do they got? Contracts on the, on the lives of you four fuckers? What is the problem here? This is a fucking civil contract. And you can't trust them to do anything right. You can get concessions out of them to thoroughly clean that area up, and you're not doing it. Why? Campaign donations. And why? Because Mitchell Englander is running for the Board of Supervisors and wants campaign donations. So for that, you will risk the lives of children, pets, and the elderly. Okay, so that concludes public testimony on this item. Uh, is there a motion to approve Mr. Englander's motion? I, I have one oh, please, question again uh, for staff on the on this in terms of, of when we start, are we starting immediately with the first five-year contract or is there an in-between period as was outlined uh, with the previous item? Good afternoon. David Hirano with the Office of the CAO. Um, under the, under the approval that you just provided for the prior item, there would be an additional year during that time. Um, city staff will negotiate with the gas company using your input and your direction to come up with a new franchise. Um, so the, um, direction, the new franchise would start assuming that we are able to complete all the negotiations at the end of the term of this existing franchise, which is scheduled to be about June 30th, 2017 now. So just to clarify again, we haven't, made any decisions on what the specifics will be of that franchise agreement. We are continuing it for another year or so, um, during which time we will negotiate whatever requirements we want into that plan. And the 25 years will now be in five-year increments per this motion. Yes, this motion directs that and a, a bunch of other things as well. So um, we're open to your direction on any matter you have for the new franchise. So. But any implication that we're we're approving this 20-year uh, uh, contract now is is off the mark. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you would have another crack at uh, a new franchise and approving that once that's negotiated and brought back to you by the staff. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? No. no. And is there a motion to approve? Motion. Second. Moved and seconded. Without objection. Adam is approved. Thank you.
Mr. All right, Mr. Chair, can I just make a quick comment for the for our young lady up in the front? Um, thank you so much for attending, and just wanted to explain to you. You know, um, we do the the Constitution protects freedom of speech. Sometimes it's unfortunate that we have outbursts, but. Uh, I'm so glad you're here and you're learning about the process, especially city government. And um, even though you might not agree, uh, we have the, uh, everybody has the ability for uh, speech. So I just wanted to explain that to you. But thank you so much for coming today and participating in the process. Well said. Thank you much. All right. So that brings us to item number 12, which is the uh, big issue today, which I think has drawn the crowd, uh, what everybody's here for. Um, uh, Come on up for just a second. Item number 12 is City Planning Department and City Attorney Reports, Ordinance, Resolution, and Environmental Impact Report relative to the Mobility Plan 2035. So uh, what I thought I might do on this one, there's a number of public speaker cards. If um, uh, Claire, if you could give a very brief and succinct overview mm -hmm. of what the item is before us. Yes. Then we'll have the, the public speakers come on up, and then we'll have you come back up for questions from... Uh, my colleagues and, and proceed that way. Perfect. Claire Bowen, Senior City Planner, uh, Los Angeles Department of City Planning. So we are in, fr in front of you today with a few amendments uh, to the mobility plan. As you may recall, the mobility plan was adopted by the City Council, I think for its third time on January 20th. So what is in front of you are a few amendments that Council members um, recommended that the Planning Department take a look at. Um, these amendments were approved by City Planning Commission and um, subsequently by the Mayor um, earlier this year. Those amendments largely have to do with additions to some of the networks. Primarily, there were several additions to the um, transit enhanced network that were done in the CD14 area. There are a number of additions to the neighborhood enhanced network, basically to improve local connections to you know, schools, parks, um, et cetera. There were some additional text amendments to basically reinforce the role of equity and um, the value and importance of regional connectivity, um, as well as making sure that we um, kind of go the, 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 further, the furthest mile in terms of making sure we're in, um, having complete community engagement. There were some additions to the pedestrian enhanced district, um, primarily in CD1, to make sure that everything that was in the bicycle enhanced or bicycle lane networks in their area were also included on the pedestrian enhanced district map, and we made some additional um, additions to that map in the CD14 area. The bicycle enhanced network and bicycle lane networks, there were again some additions primarily in the CD14 area. There were a couple of additions that were requested, um, or there was a couple of removals that were requested by CD5 um, to remove Westwood Boulevard, and there was the request to remove Central Avenue within the CD9 areas. Those two requests to remove um, segments from the bicycle enhanced network were not included in the amendments that um, we brought forth to the Planning Commission. Um, so what's in front of you today are all the amendments that were approved by Planning Commission and the Mayor. Um, and I just wanted to maybe just kind of walk you through what would be the process going forward, knowing that there may still be some concerns from the Council offices regarding the, the proposal that's in front of you. Should the um, committee want to make some changes to what is in front of you today, you certainly are free to do that. Any of those amendments then, then would then carry forth to the full council. But because the, the amendments you're making are different from what Planning Commission and the Mayor sent to you, anything that um, is, a, is approved at council would have to go back to the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission, if they concur with your decision, they would go on to the Mayor. Um, and if the Mayor and the uh, City Planning Commission both concur with any amendments you choose to make today or at full council, then it would simply be required a simple majority to then fully approve those amendments. If the City, Cal if the city Planning Commission or the Mayor rejected the amendments that you guys might send to them, then it would require a two-thirds majority when it gets to full council or if both the mayor and the city planning commission reject the amendments, then it would require a three-quarter vote. So I thought it would just be helpful for me to walk you through um, kind of what the process is for deviating from what you're getting from the planning commission. So every time we make a change, we get to play ping pong with the planning commission and re -vote on the mobility right. plan. So hopefully this is the last, yeah, <laughs> ping pong. Okay, so uh, let's uh, start then with public comment. I'll have uh, Ms. Bowen come back up afterwards. We have a lot of public comment cards, probably a half hour's worth of testimony here. Um, Looks like Bobby Benton, no, I'm sorry, Bonnie Benton, um, followed by David Karwaski and Eric Bruins and Hyaron Lee. The four of you can come up to the table. Oh. 
Ms. Benson. Yes, thank you. I'm Bonnie Benson, Deputy Chief Sustainability Officer for UCLA. Um, I'm here today expressing our support for the Mobility Element 2035, including the bike lanes on Westford Boulevard and Westford Village. As a bicycle commuter that takes that route, I can personally speak to the benefits of bike lanes. Uh, to me and the other over 3,000 cyclists coming to UCLA, UCLA on a daily basis, bike lanes promote safe and healthy transportation uh, that reduces congestion while also increasing community engagement between individuals and the surrounding community and the neighborhood. Westward Boulevard is the most direct route to our campus. The streets parallel to Westward Boulevard include narrow intersections and curves, making Westward the best option for the lane. Um, and in closing, just wanted to express that a fully developed bicycle infrastructure is an investment in a stronger and healthier community. Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Heron Lee, and I'm a bicyclist, transit user, and pedestrian. And Mobility 2035 is a vision document that reimagine how Angelinos get around the city. And the vision is only possible if the council, government agencies, and residents are invested in making it a reality. Taking things out of this plan this early, only a few after adopting this plan, shows the city's lack of commitment to the plan and jeopardize the in integrity of the plan. The four enhanced networks are called networks because every street in those networks plays an essential role to connect places. Streets like Westwood and Central that are already serving hundreds and thousands of bicyclists and pedestrians every day should be kept in the plan as the planning commission and the city staff recommended for, for, for further studies and community engagement process. We should not take opportunities away to make these streets better from, from the future. Please keep the network intact. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm David Karwalski, Senior Associate Director for UCLA Transportation. I am here today to again support the Mobility Element 2035 as it stands, including the bike lanes on Westwood Boulevard and Westwood Village. As you consider your options, <clears throat> I wanted to provide some information that may be useful to you. First, UCLA traffic into and out of campus has decreased from 120,000 vehicles per day to 100,000 vehicles per day in the past 10 years. It's 20,000 less vehicle trips or 10,000 less vehicles per day. At the same time, bicycling has risen to about 3,100 bicyclists per day coming to UCLA each weekday. More than 3,000 bicyclists. Westwood LeConte is the number one used entrance for bicyclists. Further, we'll be launching our bike share program later this year, and those users will absolutely be happy to have a bike lane on Westwood Boulevard. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Eric Bruins. I'm speaking as a CD5 resident today um, in support of the staff recommendation uh, with mobility plan with Westwood and Central in, included in the networks. Um, you know, as a, as a West Sider, I, I ride my bike on Westwood Boulevard a, a few times a month. And of course, you know, I can speak to my personal interest. It, it would make my life better to have that bike lane. Um, but we can't make transportation policy based on our personal interests. We have to have a citywide interest. And that's really the strength of this plan is it puts safety and equity as the primary uh, policy priorities for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, we know this plan has been through many iterations over the past year, um, and each one of those amendments has made the plan stronger, has put safety and equity first and been consistent with that. The, the consideration to remove Westwood and Central from the plan is not consistent with that, and so therefore I support the staff recommendation, I support the, the Planning Commission recommendation and the mayor, and encourage you to keep the, the mobility plan intact. Thank you. Thank you all. Our next four speakers are Georgina Serrano, Tamika Butler, uh, Scott Chan, and Malcolm Harris. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Georgina Serrano. So we support Mobility, mobility Plan 2035 because we need a bike lines, more bike lines on the city. Um, families already uh, use Central Avenue with no protection. So my request is please put it a, a save on these families with children uh, using the Central Avenue for many purposes. But uh, most important for me is support the metro investment and uh, encourage to use the bicycles and not the automobiles in our city. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
I'm Tamika Butler, the Executive Director of the Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition, and I'm here to speak in support of the staff recommendation to make sure that Central and Westwood are left in the mobility plan. I think sometimes at the Bike Coalition we get a bad rap as being a group of white guys only from the west side. Um, hopefully it's clear that I'm not a white guy um, from the west side. And I also think that just the folks who we so happen to be placed at this table with today are a good example of the type of folks we're here for. As somebody who lives um, in Lamert Park and uses Central all the time, the reality is, is that people are already riding on that street. And while I can certainly understand the need for all of you as elected officials to really respect your constituents and respect your colleagues' ability to respect their constituency, the reality is that this plan puts safety first. It's award-winning because it's visionary and it's about connectivity. And when somebody dies on a street, like people who bike and bike walk continue to do, are you going to say that's not my fault because it's not my district? I don't think you will because we need a connected plan and a connected vision for the city. Good afternoon. My name is Scott Chan. I'm the director of the Asian Pacific Islander Obesity Prevention Alliance. We are a nonprofit group focused on access to healthy food, access to healthy environments. Uh, because of that last point, we really support the adoption of the plan as is, uh, especially for API communities across the city. Um, if you look at Chinatown, Little Tokyo, Historic Filipino Town, Koreatown, all these areas have major mobility issues, and this is something that really needs to pass. We're also very supportive of the Central Avenue piece in this, and we would like to keep that in, in there as well. So we are in support of the adoption of the plan as is. Thanks. Malcolm Harris, Trust South LA. Uh, you know, we know that Central is a highly used corridor. Um, and we know that there are high levels of fatalities and accidents along Central. In particular, 63% of folks who bicycle ride on the sidewalks because of the road conditions of the street. And also over the last 10 years, 230 people have been hit while walking or biking. Uh, and, and so we support the vision behind creating a, a, a plan like Mobility Plan 2035 and also ask that you all, as the five representatives for the city of LA, the five council districts, that you take into consideration that, as has already been pointed out, deaths, whether they happen or fatalities or accidents, whether they happen on the south side or the west side or in the valley, affect all of us as a city. And I'm hoping that you all have taken into consideration your responsibility to make sure that those deaths do not continue. And we ask that you support the mobility plan as it stands. Thank you. Next, for, next four speakers are Adriana Mendoza, Megan Fury, uh, Bryce Rosaro, and Becky Dennison. Good afternoon, Chairman and Committee members. My name is Adriana Mendoza. I represent ARP California. Um, understanding the diverse needs of the 50-plus population when building age-friendly communities for all ages. The needs of those traveling by foot, bicycle, wheelchair, and public transit must also be considered when our communities are designed. A ARP California supports the Mobility Plan 2035 as it sets a new vision and it takes a balanced approach to provide high quality transportation options for people of all ages and abilities. Unfortunately, as we heard, many of our communities are not designed to encourage walking and bicycling, nor to provide for the safety of people who travel by foot or bicycle. People walking and bicycling are overrepresented among traffic deaths in our city. Every year, more than 200 people are killed while trying to move around LA. 30% of those killed or severely injured while walking or bicycling in L.A. are youth and older adults. On, our, on behalf of our thousands of ARP members in the city of L.A., we respectfully request you support the recommendations of the mayor, the city planning commission, and the department of city planning to adopt the current plan as is. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon. My name is Megan Peary. I'm here to represent the Westwood Village Improvement District. We manage the Westwood Village Improvement District. <laughs> Last year, our organization hosted a series of town hall meetings to hear from our stakeholders regarding bike lanes in our district. Ultimately, the issue came to our board of directors made up of property owners, merchants, and UCLA. At each of these meetings, our stakeholders resoundingly told us they were in favor of bike lanes on Westwood Boulevard. We also received many letters and emails from constituents echoing the support. Our board is supportive of the concept of bike lanes, but has questions on the impact of parking and traffic in our district. 
our board voted to unanimously support the bike study on Westwood Boulevard to understand the feasibility of bike lanes and to answer these questions. We ask that you keep Westwood Boulevard in the mobility plans so the study can be completed. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Bryce Rosaro, Council District 9, representing Councilmember Kern Price, here to speak a little bit about Central Avenue and the council member's desire to see the Bicycle Enhanced Network switch over to Avalon Boulevard for the following reasons. It's a slightly wider street, so when we talk about safety, the engineering it supports it. Also, there's several park, major parks, including Gilbert Lindsley, Recreation Center, South Park, South Los Angeles Wetlands, and also Avalon Gardens, which is a housing development at the southern portion of the district. Um, we think that's a viable alternative, especially when it continues into downtown on San Pedro. Um, and the council member is committed to developing it, also taking a look at the Vision Zero plan, the information that's starting to come out. There's actually a higher rate of fatalities on Avalon at this point. It's a slightly faster moving street. So we're interested in having um, a protective network on Avalon instead of Central. Hello, I'm Becky Dennison. I'm speaking today as a, a resident of South Central Los Angeles and a constituent of CD9. I worked with Trust South LA and many other partners in the Building Healthy Communities effort in South LA to um, ensure the mobility plan was comprehensive and did promote safety and equity, and I support it as is um, and support the staff recommendation to ensure that Central Avenue remains in the bicycle network. Um, I've just heard testimony that Avalon might also be a need. We should add Avalon, not um, trade out. Central Avenue, um, in my past job. I worked between Skid Row and Pueblo del Rio community. I've driven, biked, taken the bus down that corridor uh, any number of times, and it is in great need of um, increased safety um, and the addition of bike lanes. I've also heard that there's a concern um, raised about bike lanes promoting gentrification. Um, we should not deprive our communities from much needed safety improvement because we're worried about gentrification. We prevent gentrification by protecting people, homes, and the culture and history of the community, not depriving communities from much needed improvements. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next four speakers are John Lee, Rachel Lee, Ken Klusky, and Yusenia Morales. Good afternoon, my name is John Lee. I'm a homeowner in Council District 5. I'm here to, uh, in support of the Mobility Plan 2035 as is, but I'm here primarily as a proud father of my slightly nervous 10-year-old daughter uh, who is here to, to speak on this topic as well. Please, go ahead. Hello, my name is Rachel Lee and I'm in fifth grade at Fairburn Elementary. Thank you for the chance to speak today. I'm here to ask for more bike lanes, not less, and you should not remove them from Westwood Boulevard. I live in Westwood and my family is very active. We love to bike. My dad taught me how to ride a bike on the UCLA campus. It is a way of transportation that gives you a good workout, it's healthy for you, and it's fun. I've collected 200 signatures from children in West LA to increase the number of bike lanes. We want more bike lanes and would like to see it start with Westwood Boulevard. By reading about other cities, I've learned that you can build bike lanes without losing cars, lanes for cars and without losing parking spaces. I ask that you add bike lanes and not remove them. I hope you will work to add more bike lanes throughout the city, starting with Westwood Boulevard, so that I can make memories riding my bike to UCLA with my future children. Thank you for your time and your service to our city. I don't know well done, I, Rachel. I don't know if I can beat that. I don't My know name is Ken either. Klutsky. I live at 1300 Midvale, and that is a half block from West Boulevard and two blocks from Wilshire. And I own a car, but I take the bus every day to work, almost every day. It is my choice, and I have often thought about riding my bike, but I'm 47 years old already, and I'm fairly certain that I've exhausted all of my allotment of my nine lives. So... The mobility plan of 2035 is a transformational document because it invests in the future generation by giving alternative transportation a choice where it makes the most sense. Westwood Boulevard is a major bicycle arterial for one of the largest universities in California. Please give the bike lanes, transportation in the city of Los Angeles and our youth, the future generation, a chance. I urge you to adopt the mobility plan 2035 with all the network intact so that we can travel safely on the streets of Los Angeles. Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Yesenia, born and raised in South LA. I've been living there since I was um, born, since my mother's womb. And the thing that has come to my concern is that I've noticed that, yes, they mentioned that the, um, they think that Avalon, adding the bike lane to Avalon is better. But the thing is, I feel that our council member and other people that work there don't bike. I bike on a daily basis, and I, ha I typically ride from my house to East LA when I have to do chores. I ride from my house, which is by the 110 freeway, by Slauson, all the way to other places. I bike up to 20 miles a day. It's really important for me to have this bike lane, one, because this is my life. I've gotten in an accident like three times, messed up both my knees, and I'm terrified of bike, but this is the only way I have to get around. It's not fair that just because certain people don't want it, it should be taken out. I beg you that it is really important for us to have this bike lane on Central Avenue. It's not only for me, but it's for every single person, mothers, daughters, children in the community. Thank you. Thank you. The next four speakers are Victor Aquino, Gregory Vogel, Max Polemski, and Bobby Pepe. And if anybody else has speaker cards for item 12, um, we're getting to the bottom of the pile, so turn them in now. Please, please. Hey, good afternoon, council members. Um, my name is Victor. I'm a resident of Council District 8. I'm sorry, Council District 9. And um, I'm here fully in support of the mobility plan to stand as it is. Um, at the very least, twice a week, I have to go drop off my um, drop off and pick up my cousins and a few brothers that are um, going to school along Central Avenue. And um, their, main, their main form of transportation is a uh, bike, is riding a bike. Uh, so, although I'll do my best to kind of keep them safe while they're going to and from school, I realize that it's still it's still a big um, it's uh, it's seriously a, a civil civil rights issue because um, it's it's putting me on edge to have to worry about getting my my cousin and my family back home daily uh, to and from school um, because if um, they don't know their way around the street, they're too young to kind of understand all the things that are going on, um, but. Um, I feel that with the with a bike lane on Central that would provide that extra safety, it would um, it would really be um, uh, appreciated from myself and my family. So thank you. Thank you. Please. Hello, uh, my name is Gregory Bogle. I'm a, I live in Mr. Bonin's District 11. Uh, my wife gets harassed every day while she rides her bike to work at UCLA. So I'm in support of bike lanes on Westwood and more bike infrastructure in general. However, I'd like to also say that. Uh, this bike, this mobility plan doesn't go far enough. I think there needs to be, uh, all, we've built out the roads as far as possible uh, for the benefit of cars. 99 plus percent of the roads in Los Angeles are built for cars getting around. Uh, over 10 percent of Los Angeles residents do not use automobiles for their transit every day. 8 percent of Los Angeles residents use buses, but yet they're stuck in traffic behind people in single automobiles, and that will continue in this plan. This plan only adds 300 miles of bus lanes. There should be at least 800 miles of bus lanes that are actual bus, the 300 miles that you're adding aren't even actual bus lanes. They're, uh, bus, buses will still be stuck behind the lanes. So this is a good thing. Uh, however, it doesn't go far enough. Hi, uh, my name is Max Panemski. I'm the planning director at Pacoima Beautiful. Our organization advocates for residents in the Northeast San Fernando Valley, many of whom rely on walking, biking, and transit to meet their daily needs. We see the mobility plan as a crucial step in ensuring that our community has a safe way to move throughout the city. As others have mentioned, low-income communities like Pacoima suffer disproportionately from traffic fatalities. I urge you to support the recommendations of Mayor Eric Garcetti, the City Planning Commission, the Department of City Planning to adopt the plan with all supplemental amendments, but no network removal. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's uh, Bobby Pepe. I'm a committee member of the Silver Lake Neighborhood uh, Council Government Affairs Committee and Transportation Committee. I don't drive. The West Side, Westwood, UCLA, and the rest are all in inaccessible to me. With the opening of the Metro's Express uh, uh, Expo line and the Westwood bike lane, these community facilities will become a short trip for me and my family. 
Shame on this committee's environmental council member for wanting to remove this bike lane from the plan. In the words of my hero, thus, we, thus you will be known by, thus they will be known by their fruits. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. The next four speakers, uh, last four speakers, Hillary Norton, Dennis Hinman, uh, Dr. Tom Williams, and Wayne Fincino. Hi, my name is Dennis Hyman. Bicycle-specific safety treatments by the use of separation are requested to be banned from some major streets for the next 19 years of this mobility plan, no matter how many bicycle riders there are. Even though in any given year there are m much more potential bicycle riders than there are potential drivers, motorists are not more important people than pedestrians or bicycle riders. In, in 2013, LA had an estimated 1.2% of commuters primarily bicycling to work. That's the rate Portland, Oregon had in 1990. 18 years later, Portland had a rate of 6% bicycle commuters. And that was achieved with much less tools for increasing the number of bicyclists compared to now. The imperative of separating cyclists from fast and heavy motor vehicles seems obvious in light of their vulnerability and their large speed and mass differential from motor uh, traffic. Unlike motor vehicles, bicycles do not, have, do not benefit from cage construction, crumple zones, or airbags. Separating people from danger is a fundamental principle of industrial, industrial safety. Uh, can we have kids so we'll talk nice? First of all, Westwood Boulevard needs to get rid of the bike lanes in CD5. Councilman Koretz promised all of the normal-minded folks in CD5 he'd get Westwood Boulevard off this list. So please, like little kids, he has to comply with his promise to all the constituents because he goes into our neighborhood council committees with his staff and promises this will be done. And then we have Councilman Curran Price, who doesn't want Central Boulevard on the list. Why? Because when there's a fire or a rape, you have to get public safety through major corridors or people die. So you need to keep those major corridors open as a matter of public safety, especially if there's an earthquake. So get rid of Central Avenue and Westwood Boulevard. Is uh, Dr. Williams still here? Uh, Hillary Norton. I have a card for Hillary, but I haven't seen her. Uh, and uh, Beltran Emanuel. Please come on up, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Emanuel Beltran. I'm a resident at 1193 East 49th Street, and I'm here speaking for the Mobility Plan 2035. Currently, um, youth envisioning Safer Street through the uh, Great Street Challenge um, took out a community input where 60% supported protected bike lanes and 31% um, supported a bike lane. This is 91%. And this is also knowing that the street will be modified into a road diet. And uh, currently, there is 8-year-olds and 80-year-olds riding on Central Avenue. And by switching it to Avalon, it doesn't mean that those kids and those um, elderly are not going to ride on Central. Um, I ask you for you to preserve um, Central Avenue because it's historical to the community and we would like to have safer streets, okay? Thank you. Thank you. All right, so that concludes public comment on this item. If uh, Ms. Bowen and any other relevant staff can come on up. So, uh, thank you again for all the work you've done on the mobility plan, you and your staff and the staff from DOT over the past, how many years? Uh, we worked on it about four years. About four years. Uh, I'm very proud of the work uh, that you've done, and I'm very glad that this council approved such a, a, a smart and visionary document. It's, it's one that's necessary, and I'm glad that um, we have laid out networks. Uh, this issue has been to council a couple times. The issue has been back and forth between the Planning Commission a couple times. Uh, what's before us today is not the 
entirety of the mobility plan. Remind us again precisely what the, the scope is of the items before us today. All right, so what's in front of you today are largely um, responses to, to motions that were introduced by many of the council members, um, and they largely are about additions to networks, primarily in the transit enhanced network, um, the bicycle um, network, the pedestrian networks, and the neighborhood enhanced networks. There was a, there's one addition to a, or run change to a street designation in North Fairfax, and there's some, again, some just some text changes to reinforce, again, the role of equity and community engagement and regional connections. But largely, it's a fairly small subset of, uh, of changes that um, are really meant to really largely enhance the connective opportunities. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so, colleagues, uh, questions? Sure. Um, first, I want to thank uh, thank you, Councilman um, Chairman Bonin and Councilman Huizar for all your hard work on this plan. I mean, you worked well before I even got here, and you guys did extensive um, uh, work on this. And I really want to thank um, all my colleagues and the city staff for working to, with with my office to address the various concerns coming from the community. And I really want to thank the department for the inclusion of all my amendments. Um, However, with that being said, um, I still have some concerns, um, and you know, but my office will be, and I really appreciate your uh, renewed um, focus uh, on, or continued focus on community engagement and equity, as you um, stated several times today as well. And, um, but I still have concerns, and my office will be monitoring um, any and all proposed improvements to ensure there is sufficient community input. But thank you. Great, thank you. We look forward to. I don't have questions, but I have uh, a motion. So when you're ready for that, uh... do you have any questions before we go any further? Okay. All right. Speaker that arrived. Oh, okay. Uh, my understanding is that the couple uh, speakers who arrived late. So uh, Ms. Norton, you had a card in, and um, uh, Adam, did some, someone else come in who had a card a second ago? We'll let her go ahead. Sorry, there's um, steam coming off me because I just ran from the Omni Hotel, so I apologize. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of two organizations. One, I'm the executive director of FAST, Fixing Angelinos Stuck in Traffic, and I'm also here to speak as the Transportation Co-Chair for BizFed. And we are here to respectfully ask that you keep the plan as it is intact, that you don't remove any of the um, bike lanes right now. No matter what is thought about where you are on bike lanes today, the whole point of the plan was to be a 20-year vision. We ask you to keep these intact because this is part of a vision plan of interconnected networks. And we ask that you keep this in so that at such time that this is part of that vision, that we can go back to it instead of having to have everybody else reinvent the wheel just to be part of the the vision that went through a public hearing process that we are part of for five years. We ask you to keep the integrity of the plan, keep this plan as it is, implement it when it's necessary, but don't take it out of a 20-year vision. Thank you for waiting for me. Uh, Roxanne Stern. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Roxanne Stern. I live in North Village in Council District 5, and the bus lanes in Westwood Boulevard are very critical to me. And I just want you to know, I learned a new term, a YIMBY, and I want you to know that I am a YIMBY, and it means yes in my backyard. And the other, th <laughs> and, and the other thing is that I read this wonderful article by Councilman Bonin in the newsletter, um, Street Talk, May 2016, and I commend him for, for what I consider an, a, 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 encouraging bike lanes in Los Angeles. I implore you, keep my mobility plan 2035. It must stay intact. West, the metro is going to open up in days, and it's going to stop at Westwood and, and National. That's a direct path to UCLA and the village. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, go straight up Westwood Boulevard. We need the bike lanes there so that everybody can be served, not just cars, not just pedestrians, bikes.
you, you got almost as much of a round of applause as young Rachel, <laughs> <laughs> who you missed. Um, so uh, let me just ask a, a, a couple questions. Um, the, the, the process for making any changes, um, if alternatives are suggested to uh, anything that is in there now, what is the process of environmental study and analysis before an alternative comes back to the council for approval? So depending on the extent of what you might be proposing today, we might be able to be probably a fine already because again, the, the environmental document, the addendum that we did in preparation for this looked at a broad sweeping run, range of changes. Um, so there's probably likely that we can consider removing some of those and not have to make revisions to the environmental document. And for the projects that are in the mobility plan, what is the process for any of them happening? So the networks are concepts. Mm -hmm. So if there is a decision by a council person or we looked at some of the data, because remember, we want to use a lot of our decisions about where we put things in the future, really looking at where data, where are we having the highest rates of collisions, where are the most disadvantaged communities, where do you have the greatest opportunity for network connectivity. So kind of looking at that and working with the council office, we might decide that there's a specific street we want to do a bicycle lane or a protected bicycle lane on. The Next steps would be would start really with community engagement and start to really look at the specific cross section of that street and start to really decide really what is the design that is compatible with with the needs of that street and you know what can be accommodated um, in that street and whether it requires taking away you know parking lane or a travel lane or perhaps it can be done without either of those. So again, remember the mobility plan hasn't made any decisions about what the specific design of those treatments really would be, because really, it does really depend upon the actual specific nature of the street. So what, you'd have those conversations with the community, you'd be able to show them different options, maybe it's trade-offs, so this is what would happen, if, this is what it looked like if we, did a, if we took out parking, this is what it would look like if we took out a travel lane. Um, and then we would have to do additional environmental analysis. There is a statutory exemption allowed by the state for bicycle lanes, but it doesn't mean that you don't have to also do community engagement and you still have to do some of the traffic analysis so that we have at least the full range of information available to us when, when we're making decisions about whether to put that in. So we would be able to understand really exactly what would be the kind of the traffic impacts um, to making any of those changes on the street. So. Uh to anyone who has a concern about projects, um, th these are not things that are necessarily going to happen next week. These are things that could happen any time between now and 2035. That's, that's correct. It really is just kind of laying out a connective vision, but it really will take a lot more conversation, especially with the communities and with our traffic engineers um, and with our designers to really figure out what is the, the, the right treatment for those areas. And does the department have a sense of of all the various different things listed in the mobility plan, what would come up for consideration in 2017 versus 2028 or 2034? Well, I think that really for the um, implementation, a lot of it starts with Vision Zero and the high injury network that DOT has really been focusing on. So where improvements are gonna be going are really gonna be prioritized based on, based on some of the things that they're taking a look at. One of the other things we're actually starting in this year is that we're starting a program called Tag Your Streets. Um, and called what? It's called Tag Your Streets. Um, it stands for Technical Assistance Grant Program, something that um, planning is going to be rolling out in conjunction with our partners in DOT and BOE. And it's really based on the fact that when we have tried going out to communities and telling them we're going to put a bicycle lane here, that there's been a lot of resistance. And so we think it's much better for the communities to be telling us where they'd like to see their improvements. So we really want to have improvements come to the city from basically kind of from ground up from the community. So we'll be launching this program hopefully in the next couple months, and then communities will be telling us where they want to see the improvements. We'll be then working with them, providing them technical assistance to kind of figure out, well, what maybe kind of put a more meat on their bones of their um, of their proposal, kind of fleshing it out, and then figuring out whether we have money to do that improvement now, or maybe we start to slot, we start to slot that, pro that project into a future call, call application. So that the city starts to become, basically have a pipeline for future projects, so that we're better prepared when funding opportunities come along that, again, have already been vetted by the community and have the full community support. Those applications from the community also have to be accompanied by a letter of support from the council office. So we think this is a, a new way of, of starting things and will, and will basically result in a much 
more um, productive conversation between the city and the, and, the, and the communities and ultimately result in a greater number of projects being implemented um, over the next number of years because we won't have the resistance. We'll again be putting them where communities want them. I'm fairly certain that the acronym Tag Your Streets is going to be uh, misunderstood and subject to <laughs> <laughs> some controversy at some point. Right. Uh, I understand that. Uh, so is there a way, if a council member wanted to fast track something in their district uh, to sort of get it moved faster? Right. So a great way to fast track it would be through this application process and make sure that communities, groups in your area are going to help apply for projects that you really care about. So it's a great way to, again, start that dialogue. Um, we've been talking to some of the council offices, and they really love this idea because then, again, ideas that they have, they can be working with their community groups, make sure those community groups then apply for some of those projects in this process. Okay. And if changes are made by the committee today, uh, what's the timeline of it going back to CPC and coming back to council for approval? Well, depending on how quickly you go to council, um, Right now, we've got a tentative date set for June 9th at Back at Planning Commission, holding it on the calendar, assuming that you guys make some decisions today and it moves very promptly to council. Okay. So we'll be back to council before summer recess? Conceivably, it could. I mean, it will have to go to the mayor's office after it goes to Planning Commission. So depending on there's how quickly we could get letters out, um, but if everybody decided that was really an important thing to do, that's certainly possible. Okay. Fingers right. crossed. Colleagues, further questions or Mr. Koretz? Uh, if this would be the appropriate time to make an amending motion. Mm -hmm. uh, members, as I think you all know, uh, I've been making the case for a north-south alternative to Westwood for quite some time um, and to get to uh, the greater Westwood Village and UCLA area. Um, I won't belabor the point. I'll just remind you that I very much support a bike lane into the greater Westwood Village area just not on the already congested and volatile Westwood Boulevard, um, joining uh, tens of thousands of cars a day and over 900 buses a day. Um, I'm joined in my opposition to the original location by the West Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, Westwood Homeowners Association, Westwood Neighborhood Council, Westwood Community Council, Westwood Hills Property Owners Association, Holmby Westwood Property Owners Association, and many individual residents and neighbors. And so this is how I'd like to proceed. Number one, I'd like to amend the Bicycle Enhanced Network, or BEN, by making the following changes. Substitute Gailey slash Midvale for Westwood Boulevard between LeConte Avenue and Ohio Avenue. And then I'd like to update the text in, chamber, in Chapter 6, uh, Action Plan, to amend the following sentence on page 153 under the network concepts map heading to read, quote, for example, a north-south corridor identified on the Ben could be substituted with an alternative north-south corridor that is not currently on the Ben if it serves similar constituencies and destinations and is supported with additional operational studies and community engagement. And then in addition, I'd like to make another amendment on behalf of our colleague Kern Price of CD9 to amend the Bicycle Enhanced Network by making the following changes. Substitute Avalon Boulevard for Central Avenue between Jefferson Boulevard and Imperial Highway. Add San Pedro Street between 7th Street and Jefferson Boulevard. Amend the Neighborhood Advanced Net Enhanced Network to add the following change. Add 16th Street between San Pedro and Central Avenue. And so uh, I'd like to ask that those, uh, those two motions uh, be passed by this committee. Is there a second? I'll second that. Yeah. And I have some questions on that. Please. Um, so if we were to pass these amendments again to ask the question that the chair asked, we would, what's the process? I'm, I'm not clear on the process. Right, no, i um, be happy to walk that out through again. So you would vote today with those, that amendment and it would go to full council. Council then would be directing that back to Planning Commission because you've now amended what you got from Planning Commission and the mayor. So it would go back to them. The City Planning Commission would have and the it's opportunity. It's only these two items, right? I mean, this motion. It's only the motion. It's right. Not the packet. It's just... Well, you have in front of you a packet of amendments from Planning Commission. Yeah that you're going to, sounds like you may be largely be approving, and then you're going to amend, right, what's going to go back to them would just be the amendments. 
just the amendments, but the, only the amendments would go back to CPC. Yes, oh. I believe so. Okay. okay. Really, yeah. Um, okay. Mr. Bernstein, do you want to elaborate? You're just going to have to go back. Well, I, I guess the whole package as amended would go back. Yeah, just I, for I, technical. The whole package would go back. Right, because you can't, you can't act on, if you've made changes to what they give you, that whole packet would go back to them. Mm -hmm. Now they would have in front of them what they approved, then over, overridden by your amendments. They could choose to reject the amendments that you're adding on today. If they reject it and the mayor also rejects, then when it comes back to council, you guys would have to override their objection by three-quarter votes. Mm -hmm. um, if the City Planning Commission chooses to reject but the mayor agrees or vice versa, then you only need two-thirds okay. majority to vote and over to but, oversee. But an action could, can be taken at council once it leaves this committee to say we're only sending back those two areas of uh, the two amendments uh, as proposed by Mr. Koretz, and we adopt the rest of the package. Correct? That's I think I would need some advice from the city attorney's office because you're right, you're not really, what's in front of you, you're basically accepting because what's in front of you does not include taking those out. So you could accept everything that's in front of you today from planning commission mm -hmm. and then you're going to send back simply just those two changes we're at, which are actually for oh, separate yeah, removals. It would be the whole package. The whole package has to go back. Okay. That's my belief as well. Yeah, that, okay. Because the uh, charter would require that um, any this is the, the whole package is a general plan amendment. It requires the review of the city planning commission uh, on a general plan amendment. And so th we would be acting, the, the commission would be acting on the totality of the package as amended and then bringing it back okay. based on the vote uh, <laughs> breakdown that Claire That's outlined. Correct. But there's no okay. indication the planning commission has any interest in reopening the other parts of the plan, right? No, the planning commission has been supportive of the entirety right. of the plan. And they wouldn't have the full plan back in front of them. They would, again, just have just the, have this package. This can, package, the, the yes. package, yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I think we have some time between now and council to get the full opinion, give everyone a bit more time to review this, if this were to go through, if, in fact, it could just be the package or these two, because I think there's an interest in all of us moving the other package forward, but looking at these. And the reason I, I did second Mr. Koretz's motion is because I think the original intent was for us to uh, analyze these proposed changes mm -hmm. uh, before I got to CPC. And I, I don't think that happened. Um, from my understanding, we didn't get a full analysis as to what would be the impact should be these, these amendments be made. Is that accurate or not accurate? Well, I would I mean when we looked at everything in the environmental document that we did. Um, it's also really, remember at this point, these are, this, these are just high concepts. So again, when we, when we were asked to take a look at completely removing Westwood, from a connectivity perspective, we felt that it would have great harm um, to the future opportunities to be able to make connections mm -hmm. to the Westwood area or um, comparatively in, in the central area with how these were important corridors to provide bicycle connection to. So from, simply from, um, a concept or a network perspective, we felt that was really important to remain, retain those intact. In so it was really a decision by the, the planning department to, to basically reject those two um, suggestions based on, you know, kind of our professional expertise. Yeah. And just to be clear, the, the environmental analysis of the changes had been previously requested by Councilmember Koretz and the council as a whole. Mm -hmm. That analysis was completed. The recommendation of the de of the department, as well as the planning commission, was not to make those network changes based on that information. Right. And I, I originally wasn't and not supportive of mm -hmm. making these changes. However, in the discussions we are adopting the mobility plan, I, uh, as a chair of Plum, had negotiated and talked to some of the members who wanted to make these changes and said, "Well, let's move those to CPC, get a full analysis, and see what that's like." And I, I'm just not. Um, uh, confident that that was done and I, I feel that I owed it to my colleagues in me telling them that we were going to give this a full hearing and analysis as it went back to CBC so I, I'd, I'd love to see that if we do send this back to CPC that we provide a, a transparent analysis as to what the impacts are actually are and if there's some public document out there to see that. 
I think the challenge, again, is, as um, Ken said, that with the analysis was done in the environmental document. The challenge is when we are looking at analysis at a citywide level, we're not down to the point where, we're, which we would do later on, if we actually said we're going to look at the Westwood corridor or the Central corridor, we would be looking then really kind of at an intersection level, we'd be able to really kind of understand what the impacts would be of removing or having that lane in there. At the citywide level, though, we were really analyzing things really at kind of an APC level. So removing a little piece here and adding another piece here doesn't, at a citywide level, produce a lot of changes that you can really see. I mean, it was kind of like a 0 .001 kind of change if I brought the environmental consultants here to be able to talk about it in technical terms. So that analysis is in the environmental um, addendum, but again, it doesn't show a, a lot of change. So we're really, what we're, we're really kind of left with talking about it from more qualitative perspective, which is what I've articulated about the importance of make, maintaining that connectivity and giving us the opportunity in the future to really do that much more in-depth analysis and really have an understanding of really what truly would be the impacts to the community as well as what would be the, um, the increased safety benefits. Because again, um, we don't have that level of detail at this point. Okay. And Mr. Koretz, your, your proposed amendment, um, you're providing alternatives. You're not taking anything out. Is that no, and, and in fact, uh, it would be hard for me to understand the connectivity argument of substituting another street that's a block away. Um, and obviously the ability to connect to that street, it seems like it would be a hard case to explain that that ruined connectivity. Um, I think at this, I mean, at the time we did the analysis, um, the opportunity to look at Gailey was not presented to us. We were asked just to simply analyze removing uh, Westwood Boulevard. I think that Gailey, you know, I think Having Gailey on there is not necessarily a bad thing. It does provide some of the connectivity. I think some might argue that it doesn't provide as direct a connectivity, but I think that it does provide, it is a, a parallel corridor and I don't have any objections at this point. Thank you. Good, and just to finish my comments, I, I didn't agree that we should make any changes to the original plan as proposed, but I did commit to my colleagues that they'll have their day in court as they go to CPC to get more fuller analysis than was provided, and that's really what I, what I was looking for, so. I um, second that motion. Next. Okay, I'm more confused than I was before. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Avalon and Gailey, uh, have, they, have they or have they not been analyzed as appropriate substitute uh, connectivity routes? Uh, so, in the addendum, we did not look at Gailey because we were asked simply to consider remove, what would be the impacts of removing Westwood Boulevard. So that's what we did. What we, we did look at um, in the addendum, we looked at removing Central and adding Avalon, but actually Avalon was actually already on because we had already added Avalon on as a bicycle lane several in, early on in the development of the mobility plan. So Avalon already had a bicycle lane um, and it was proposed that Central was going to be where you're going to put it protected. So the, uh, the analysis in that case simply looked at what, re, what would it would be to remove Avalon, I mean Central from the protected bicycle lane and then convert Avalon, or basically upgrade Avalon from a bicycle lane to a protected. But there really isn't any difference in terms of the analysis in that case because the analysis for looking at a lane for, versus protected is the same. Um, but even though we, the analysis did not look at putting Gailey in as a parallel corridor, again, because we're at a very high level, we feel like we can make that substitution. Because again, as um, Councilman Koretz pointed out, it's one block away, so we don't have a problem in terms of the environmental, because we've, we've, it's kind of under the umbrella of what was looked at. Okay, all right, now I understand. Okay. Mr. Rudin, do you have any further questions? No. Okay, all right. So, um, uh, what is before us then, procedurally, is Mr. Koretz's amendment. Correct. Uh, which uh, uh, changes the staff recommendation and uh, substitutes in Gailey, Avalon, and makes the other technical changes be right into the record. Mr. Clark, are you clear on what the amendments are? Uh, yes, we are. We have been. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, let's uh, do a vote on that. Mr. Kretz? Aye. Mr. Root? Aye. Mr. Wiesar? Aye. And uh, I'm going to be casting a no vote on that. Let me just be very clear. I absolutely uh, respect uh, the work that Mr. Kretz and Mr. Price have done. I understand this is an extremely difficult balancing act to get this right. 
uh, very, very hard choices. And uh, uh, I, I don't easily or readily cast a vote against what the, the council members want in their own districts. But for me, I, I was very close to this product. And I really, for me, the integrity of it is, is, is sacrosanct. And uh, particularly because it's about networks. And uh, so I have a very high bar about trying to, to, to change the networks. And uh, so with much, much due respect to both of my colleagues, I'm gonna cast a, a, a no vote on this one and, and, and keep the plan. Uh, so the vote on that one is uh, three to one uh, in favor of Mr. Koretz's motion. And that'll be the recommendation that goes to city council and that is scheduled for council already. Uh, that, that will be in council this Friday, uh, 10 a.m. Uh, just for clarification, um, we'll, it'll be on the 17th on Tuesday. What will be the 17th on Tuesday? It would be next, excuse me. Oh, it won't be this Friday, it'll be? It'll be, be next Tuesday. Okay. Tuesday, May 17th. Okay, all right. That's, I, that's what I've been informed. Is everybody in agreement on that one that's in the know? Is that okay with timelines? I'm looking at the CLA. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, Mr. Chair, now that um, we voted on that, I'd like a, if our city attorney and our staff could look into whether we could in council uh, approve the package and just send these two items back to CPC, yeah. um, if, that, if that's feasible. I, I, I see no reason why not. We did this with this package <laughs> after all from the whole plan. So I think in my opinion, uh, unless there's some legal review that I'm not aware of, that we could probably adopt the whole package and just take these, the, the amendment back to CPC. We'll review that okay. and, and coordinate with the Land Use Division. Thank you. So. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I've just been informed uh, that actually this will be before Council this Friday at 10 a.m. Okay, so let me just clarify everybody listening. If everybody could listen for just a second. Uh, the original statement that this is in Council this Friday at 10 a.m. is correct. Uh, it will be this Friday at 10 a.m. I don't want there to be any confusion about that. What does that mean exactly, this Friday at 10 a.m.? Th th this, this item will be before the full city council. On Friday? Friday. 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 Okay. Not Tuesday. Okay, so that is now confirmed with the clerk, the CLA, my staff, everybody's on the same page. Uh, so uh, that um, ends today's agenda. Thanks, everybody, for being here. We are adjourned. <laughs>